Welcome to Lakes Pond Baptist Church. Uh, a couple of announcements. I was going to mention one of them I mentioned this morning. That's there's going to be an ushers meeting for those that uh, help with the security, all of that. Uh, July 10th. That's a couple Sundays from now at 5 p.m. So before the evening service. All right, 396. 396. We'll stand and sing when the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. 396. <clears throat> When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, we thank you tonight for for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation that we have so freely received. And Lord, we look to that day when we will see you face to face and knowing that we have a hope that's been prepared for us, an eternal life that awaits us. And Lord, we rejoice in that and we look forward to that. And tonight as we've come together into this place, we ask for your blessing upon our time, upon everything that is said and everything that is done. And we pray that you would have first place in our hearts and in this service now. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated, and we'll sing 685. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below, but I know I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Number 685. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransomed will shine, I've got a gold one that silver lined. I've got a mansion just over in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday under we will never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold though often tempted tormented and tested and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in 
a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday streets that are pure as gold. 673. We'll sing number 673. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. 673. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Us will sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day! Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And then we'll stand and sing number 690. As we stand in the suite, by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore, number 690. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore 
we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirit shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer of his love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore Thank you. You may be seated. We'll take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 and verse 21 tonight. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 and verse 21. Tonight we continue on the series that we began uh, last week unstoppable. God is able to finish that which he has begun. We looked at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And tonight I want to look at, starting in, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 21, the title of tonight's message is An Unstoppable God. We have an unstoppable God. So Romans chapter 4 and verse 21 Speaking of Abraham, it says, in being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. We pray now for your Holy Spirit to do his work in our hearts. Help us to understand it. Help us to use it and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't consider myself a handyman in any sense of, of the word, but uh, I am willing to like watch a YouTube video, and if I, or several usually, but if, if I find that it's something that I have tools for and it's not that difficult, I'm willing to try it. Amen. So, you know, go for it. Why not? Um, try and save myself some money. Most recently, uh, the, the car that we got started making a, a noise, right? You would turn uh, like a real loud clicking noise that came from behind the, um, the glove box, and it was like, the car didn't have to be running. You could just like have the air conditioner on, shut the car off, and it would, it would start clicking. And so uh, Erica told me about this. She had driven the car and came back, and it was, it was doing that. So, you know, I, I Google it, you know, clicking noise from car. <laughs> you know, uh, well, more specific, right, my model of car and, and all that. Uh, and it turns out it's a pretty common thing with these Impalas. And so it's the blend door actuator, which I had no idea what that was. Turns out. Uh, like when you have the air conditioner on and you're changing it from like where you want it to come from like uh, the floor or out the dash or up above, whatever. Um, there's this thing that moves and it changes how the air goes. And so there's two little parts, blend door actuators that are on either side of that and they do the thing to move it, right? So one of those was bad and the gears inside were slipping and that was that loud clicking noise. Pretty, it was pretty easy to get to. It was right, you can take the, the glove box out, and it was like right there on the side. So there's two of them there. One is a little easier, and mine was the one that's slightly more difficult, but it's not too bad. There's like the electrical wires that clip into it. Those come out real easy. And then there's two hex head screws. That's all it is, right? So that's right up my alley. That's something I can do. Uh, so I figured out what it was, and I got the new part, um, and then, so I'm like, got the clip out, that's fine, the, and then the, the screws. So I go to my little socket set there that I've got. And do you know, I'm missing one socket in that set. 
The YouTube video told me which one it was, the size, and that's the size I did not have, but I went, maybe they're wrong. So I tried the next one up, that's too big. Next one down, that's too small. So of course I had to go to Home Depot to get the, the size that I need. And it was a little tricky to get it in and out, but I got it done. You know, that's kind of the extent of what I'm able to do. Two little bolts or two screws and something that clips in. That's, that's the extent of my electrical ability. But really, no matter how handy you are, there comes a point where you just have to say, I'm gonna call a professional. You know, I'm gonna call someone to come in and do it. And maybe it's because you just don't know how to do it. Maybe it's you don't have the tools, you don't have the, the know-how to get that done. Maybe it's just you don't have the time. You go, I don't, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to put the couple hours into this. I'd rather pay someone else to come do it, take it somewhere to have someone else do it. But at some point you go, let's just call a professional. I'll find someone that is able to do that. And, but you know, there is a lot of times where we just run into like a lack of ability, where we just don't know how to do it. We're just not able to do it. We don't have the things that it takes to get that done. And we go, I'm going to find someone that is able to do that. And tonight, as Christians, we found someone that is able to do all that we need him to do. We found God. We found an unstoppable God. And the fact that we have a God that is unstoppable, who is able in every situation, makes a huge difference for us. And boy, the impacts that this has upon our life. And that's what this series is about. It's about what God is able to do. The fact that God is who he is, that he is unstoppable, and he's able to do so much for us. And I really, in this series, I want us to get a hold of that, that part of the nature and character of God, that he is able, that God is able. And I was thinking about, uh, in this introduction, taking just a, you know, a couple miracles and, and looking at those, and just by way of introduction about the fact that God is able. And then I had a better idea. I said, how about I just, instead of looking at a couple, because that would give us a good idea. But how about I just read a list <laughs> of the miracles that God has done? So I have, I have a list. These are not, this is not all the miracles, but this is a lot of them. Just to give us a sense, right? Like an, an overview about all the things that, well, not all the things, but a lot of the things that God has done. Just to give us like a, so that we're overwhelmed with, by, with how much God has done and how much God is able to do. So God is able to create an entire world and a solar system out of nothing, including people. God is able to flood the entire earth but keep one family safe. He's able to change everybody's languages. He's able to take a couple, Abraham who was 100 and Sarah who was 90, and cause them to have a child. He's able to destroy a wicked city with fire and brimstone from the sky. He's able to light a bush on fire but not allow it to burn. He's able to turn Moses' staff into a snake and turn it back again. He can turn Moses' hand leprous and then back again. He's able to do those 10 plagues in Egypt to deliver uh, Israel. He's able to lead a nation through a wilderness with just a cloud and a pillar of fire. He's able to make a dry path through a sea. He's able to turn contaminated water pure at Marah for Israel. He was able to make bread appear every morning for a hungry nation. He was able to bring large flocks of quail to feed a nation. He was able to cause fountains of water to pour out of a rock in the middle of a desert. He was able to open the earth beneath a group of rebellious men. He was able to make a staff that had been long dead to come alive and produce buds and flowers. He was able to send venomous snakes into Israel's camp and then provide healing through a simple look. He was able to have a donkey speak to a disobedient prophet. He was able to part a river. He was able to cause the fortified walls of a city to drop into the ground. He was able to stop the sun and the moon from moving across the sky. He was able to send the dew to cover only a single sheepskin one morning, and the next morning to cause the dew to miss only a single sheepskin. He was able to give one man supernatural strength to deliver a nation. He was able in an empty pagan temple to make an idol fall down before the Ark of the Covenant, and to do that twice, the second time having the hands and the head break off that idol. He was able to defeat a trained and armored giant by the hand of an untrained and unarmored shepherd boy. In the midst of a famine, he was able to feed a prophet by using ravens to deliver food. In the same famine, he was able to feed a prophet with a barrel of meal and a jar of oil that never ran out. He was able to raise a young boy from the dead. He was able to send fire from heaven and melt a stone altar that was covered in water. He was able to send rain in response to a prophet's prayer. He was able to carry a prophet to heaven in a chariot of fire. 
He was able to part a river when hit by the coat of a prophet. He was able to enable a widow's jar of oil to multiply as a source of income for her. He was able to raise a woman's son from the dead. He was able to heal a Syrian soldier from leprosy. He was able to give leprosy to a greedy servant. He was able to cause a sunken axe head to float on the water. He was able to open the eyes of a servant to see an army of angels there to defend them. He was able to cause an entire army to be struck blind and then restored. He was able to move the shadow on a sundial backwards. He was able to strike a king down with leprosy. He was able to cure another king and give him 15 more years to live. He was able to keep three young men alive in a superheated furnace. He was able to keep a man alive in a pit with ravenous lions. He was able to bring a large whale to swallow a fleeing prophet. He was able to keep that prophet alive in that whale's stomach. He was able to turn water into wine when needed at a wedding. He was able to heal a man who had been crippled for 38 years. He was able to resurrect a friend who had been dead for three days. He was able to fill a fisherman's net with fish. He was able to allow a man to walk on top of water. He was able to pay taxes by making a coin appear in a fish's mouth. He was able to heal a deaf man, to heal people of leprosy, to heal multiple blind men. He was able to restore a servant's ear after it had been sliced off by a sword. He was able to cast out demons, to calm a violent storm, to heal a man's withered hand, to heal a woman who had been sick for 12 years, to raise a young girl from the dead, to walk on water. He was able to feed multitudes with a small amount of food. He was able to use two disciples to heal a man crippled from his birth. He was able to free Peter from prison by opening the prison doors before him. He was able to blind a man with light from heaven and later restore his sight. He was able to free Paul and Silas from prison with an earthquake. He was able to cause a young man who had fallen out of a window and died to come back to life. He was able to prevent Paul from dying when bitten by a venomous snake. And he was able to give one man an extensive vision of eternity and heaven. And that's not even all of them. But there's probably some you go, you missed a couple. You know, you missed that one and, and you, you missed this one. And it's true. That is not all of the miracles that Jesus Christ did and that, that God has done. And you know what we could also do? We could take that list that, that kind of ended with the book of Revelation and we could continue on from there. With, with miracles that, that believers have given account of throughout the years from that time. We could go on in just our lifetime and recount the miracles that God has done and give testimony to the fact that our God is able, that God is able to do all of this and so much more. And the fact that God is able, and that we can continuously say that God is able, has such big implications for us as we live the Christian life and as we try and serve the Lord and as we face all that we face in this life, knowing that we have a God that is able. And in Romans chapter 4 and verse 21, Paul is referencing Abraham and, and something that Abraham went through and it was one of the miracles that I mentioned where God had, had come to Abraham and to Sarah and, and told them that they were going to have a child. They were going to have a son even as Abraham was 100 and, and Sarah was 90. And when that takes place, Abraham receives that, and Sarah, though, as she overhears that, she laughs at that in, in unbelief. And Sarah laughed that God could do that. But then what's interesting is even after this promise, later on, they try and find a way to get this done. They try and find their own way to bring this to pass, and they cannot make it happen. But God does. And, a, and Paul says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 24 or 21 that, Abraham was fully persuaded that what God was able, or what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And what I want to look at tonight is two characteristics that make God unstoppable. Two reasons from the characteristics and the nature of God, why God is always able. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, as Paul is talking, he, he really brings out both of those in an interesting way. He says that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And the two characteristics are, number one, the power of God. And then number two, the wisdom of God. But the, the power of God, that God can make a way. In every situation, God can make a way. When I was in, in college, it was for one of the breaks. I was in college in North Carolina. It was either uh, fall or spring break. I can't remember which. I went home with uh, a friend of mine from West Virginia. So we were in North Carolina going uh, north to, to West Virginia. 
And um, we took I-77, which I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but up through Virginia into West Virginia. And as you, as you get to the border of, of Virginia going into West Virginia, I-77 comes up on the East River Mountain, which is part of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And you're coming up on, on this mountain, East River Mountain, but then the road, I-77, instead of like going up over the mountain, it just goes straight through the mountain. And there is the East River Mountain Tunnel. And it's a little over a mile long, straight, literally straight through this mountain. Like it doesn't curve, it goes right through this mountain. And you know, there was, there was a road that went over it, uh, but it was, a, it was a pretty rough road. Uh, they say it was, you know, there a lot of turns and you're on the edge of a mountain and it, all sorts of things could go wrong. And they said, let's not do that. Let's not, let's just go right through this mountain. And I go, that's, what, it, what like, the power that we have as individuals to make a way, to look at a mountain and go, let's just go right through this mountain. And I assume it took a lot of like dynamite. I assume, I don't know, I didn't research it. But I assume it took like dynamite to get through that and some drilling, I don't know. And just like a lot of power to look at a mountain and go, I'm gonna make a way straight through that. We look at our God and we say a God that is able to make a way. Right? No matter what stands in the path, God can make a way. And that project took, it took $40 million in the, in the 1970s to accomplish that. And when you have the power, though, you are literally able to make a way. And that's what we see in God. Psalm 89 and verse 6, For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Who can we hold up next to God and say they're at all comparable? And they're all on an equal level. There is no one. Isaiah 26 and verse 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Everlasting strength. Now, uh, when we look at both the power and the wisdom of God, I want to look at both of those um, from this perspective, the perspective of the gospel. Because that's the, I think that's the greatest example that we can find of both the power and the wisdom of God. Um, as it applies to us. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul said that is the power of God unto salvation. And when we look at, at the power of God in the gospel, it shows us that God is stronger than we are. It shows us that, that God is more powerful. He is more able than we are. In Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 6, it says, For we, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. When we could not make a way for us to be saved, God made a way. We were without strength. We had gotten ourselves into this situation. We had gotten ourselves into our sin, but we could not get ourselves out. We couldn't make a way out of where we found ourselves. And it, wasn't, and it wasn't for a lack of trying, was it? And there's a lot of people who have done a lot of things to try and get themselves saved. A lot of great things. They've given a lot. They've, they've sacrificed a lot. They've done so much in, a, in an attempt to make a way to God, to make a way for their salvation. And yet, every single time, no matter how hard they tried and how much they gave, how much they worked, they failed every single time. They failed to make a way. They were proven to be yet without strength. But Jesus Christ was able. Amen. When we could not, Jesus Christ was able to make a way for us to be saved. He was strong enough to die and was strong enough to raise himself from the dead. And both of those took a strength that we did not have. We couldn't die for our sins. We could not raise ourselves from the dead. And when we look at what Jesus Christ has done for us, we see his strength and then we see our weakness. But we, we learn this. When we look at ourselves and our inability, we understand that life's not hopeless just because we can't do something. Just because we can't make a way doesn't mean that there is no hope and that, that there is no possibility because it's in those times where we look to Jesus Christ and we look to one who is able. And it's very easy for us to to look at our limits and to look at what we can't do and what we're not able to do and kind of impose those same limits on God. Where we look at it and say, if I can't do it, then it's just not possible. It'd be like a, like a little kid who goes to, the, goes to the fridge and they wanna, 
they're going to make themselves a jar of, uh, or a, a sandwich of uh, peanut butter and jelly, right? So they get the jelly out there and the, and the lid is stuck. So they try and they try and they're just not able to open that lid and they set it back in the fridge and they go, no one can do it. I'll never get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's just not possible. The jar is stuck closed. Nobody can open it. And then along comes mom or dad and they go, no, it's, it is possible. And we can do that with God. We can look at our life and go, man, I've tried. I just can't do it. Not possible. There's no way this will get done. There's no way it'll be accomplished. We just need to look to God. We need to look to the one that is able to do that. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When we see the gospel, we see the power of God compared to our weakness. And we understand that God is stronger than we are. The strength of God is greater than our weakness. But we also find that the gospel shows us that he's stronger than our enemies. God is stronger than our enemies. When, tra when Satan tried to stop God, God still made a way. And, and since the, the fall of, of Satan, God, er, Satan has continually tried to oppose the plan of God and, and the way of God. And when Jesus Christ was here on earth, Satan tried to tempt Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ was, was stronger than that. He proved himself to be stronger than Satan. Satan used Judas to try to betray Jesus Christ and, 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 and crucify Jesus Christ and, and to stop Jesus Christ. And yet in all of that, Jesus Christ showed himself to be stronger than Satan. And I like what it said way back in Genesis, that Satan is going to bruise the heel of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ would bruise the head of Satan. That's the strength of God, that he is stronger than our enemies then those that would try and stand against us, those that would try and stop us, God is greater than all of that. And God is, is always able, no matter what. No matter how limited we are, no matter how great our enemies might seem, God is greater, God is stronger. And God, because of his almighty power, God is always able to make a way. So we see the power of God, but then the second characteristic is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God, he can find a way. He can find a way to get it done. Many people have, have compared life to, to a puzzle, right? You can all find all sorts of quotes and read all sorts of things, how people, like life is a puzzle and we're trying to put the pieces together and for the non-believer, it's, it's like a random puzzle that doesn't really have a picture, you know, and it's just kind of pieces that are just thrown there by chance and they're trying to fit them together. For a believer though, we understand that everything has a plan, that God's got a plan in all of this. And when the pieces all come together, there is the picture of Jesus Christ, right? That's the puzzle that we know that we're working with. But puzzles take, they take thought to put the pieces together. I like to do puzzles. I enjoy them. Um, I, I enjoy them sporadically. It's not an everyday thing or an every week thing. It's, you know, a couple times a year I enjoy doing a puzzle. Um, but I, I don't like them when they're too hard. So I've I'm, maybe I'm not a purist in some people's minds. You can judge me all you want. I do the edges first, and I use the box, right? So <laughs> there's some people out there who are probably like, no, you can't do the edges first. That's cheating, and you cannot use the box or whatever. I do. I don't want it to be that hard. Um, but you know, you, you know how it is. You're putting pieces together, and, and you find one, and you go, I think it fits here. I think this piece goes here, but it's a little tighter. Than, <laughs> you know, it just, you got to push it a little bit to get it to, to go in that, in, in that spot, and you go, looks kind of right. I think it goes there. But when you push it in, it's just a little more difficult than you think. And you, then you have second thoughts like, I don't know. Is it, does it fit? But if you, get a, if you force a piece where it doesn't go, you're going to throw off the rest of the puzzle, aren't you? If, you just, if you're not sure, but you put it there anyways, it's going to wreck the rest of the puzzle if you leave it there. Because it takes wisdom and thought to get the pieces in the right place the wisdom of God in our life, that he is able, not just powerful enough to make a way, he is wise enough to find a way and to find the perfect way and the right way. And again, we hold that up in contrast to who we are in our ability and our lack of wisdom on our own, in our flesh and, and by ourselves. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, Paul he praises the wisdom of God in relationship to the gospel. And he says this, Oh, the depths 
of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And again, the gospel shows us that, that God is wiser than we are. He is wiser than we are. Our knowledge is, is so limited by our humanity. Uh, it's, it's limited by, um, by our, our capacity to hold things in our mind, right? There, we're just so limited in that way. Um, like what our mind can hold and, and focus on and things we can remember and we're constantly forgetting. We're just limited by that. We're also limited by the fact that we are constrained to time and place. We can be in one place at a time, right? And we are just slowly moving through time. There is a past, there is a present, and there is a future. And all of those things play into the fact that we're just not as wise as God is. We are limited in all of that. And that all of that restricts the wisdom and restricts the knowledge that we have. But there are no constraints to the wisdom of God. There are no constraints. There is no limit to the knowledge of God. And man could not find a way to God. We couldn't make a way. We could not find a way to God. And yet God found a way to reconcile us to himself. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We were, it said, alienated and enemies in our, in our mind by wicked works. We had a, a, a perverted and, and corrupted intellect that just was not able to find a way to God. And we look at, at, at this world and we see the, the sort of mind that's out there in the world and, and the corruption that is there. But even as, even as we knew that there was this problem, right? We knew that there was this separation between us and God because of our sin, even knowing that, yet we could not find a way apart from God to fix it. We couldn't find a way to make things right, but God found the way. God found a way, and then he made it clear to us. Psalm 147 and verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God was able to find a way to reconcile us to himself. So God is wiser than we are, but God is also wiser than our enemies. God is wiser than our enemies. You know, Satan thought it would be, a, he thought it would be smart to attack Job, right? And he thought he could really foil the plan of God in Job's life by attacking Job and taking away so much from Job and, and his family and all that he had and then even Job's health. And yet we see that God had a plan through all of that. And in the end, God's plan was wiser even than Satan's plan. What Satan had for Job, God outsmarted him. God outsmarted him. And that's, that's who God is and that's what God is able to do. We see the, the wisdom of Satan as he tries to stop the gospel in, 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 through Jesus Christ, right? And he tried to, again, turn Judas against Jesus Christ and betray Jesus Christ and the temptation of, of Satan. That was all of Satan's plan in all of this. And yet consistently, Jesus Christ showed himself to be wiser. And what's interesting is all of that, all that Satan did fit into the plan of God. It fit into God's perfect plan through Jesus Christ to bring about salvation. God is smarter than Satan, and God is smarter than all our enemies. And I like what, uh, what Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50, after all was said and done, he was betrayed by his brothers, and then in, into Egypt, and all of that, it comes down all the way to the end, and here's Joseph's summation of what took place. He said, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. That's who God is. He's able, even when people do things that are wrong and they try to oppose the plan of God, God is smarter than they are. And the wisdom of God means God is able to find a way. God is able because his wisdom is infinite. And the wisdom of Jesus Christ means that he knows the end from the beginning. And for us, it means we are never without a source of guidance and a source of wisdom. Anytime we need wisdom, we have someone who has that wisdom, who is wisdom that is, that is infinite, far beyond ours. And again, we can't take the limits that apply to us and then apply them to God. Say, so if we don't know it, then how can anyone know it? God knows. And we can have the wisdom of Jesus Christ when we ask. So God is able because he is all-powerful and because he is all-knowing. And I want us to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 
as we close. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. Because there was a time when King Jehoshaphat faced, faced an army that he could not match. An army that he could not defeat. An army that really he had no way of outsmarting. The Moabites and the Ammonites had rallied against him or gotten together against him and they were now encamped in Israel's land. They had crossed the border into Israel. And he was understandably af afraid because of this. But then in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, look what he says, so that none is able to withstand thee. And he goes on to, to remind them of what God has done, and to remind himself. But in all that he feared, in all that he, he faced, the armies that were against him, he really had to come down to this point where he looked to who God was. And he reminds himself of one thing, that God is able. That he had a God that was able, beyond the power that those enemies could, could muster and bring against him, beyond all of their battle plans and all the plans that he could come up with, setting all of that to the side, he said, God is able. And therefore, I know, he says, that there is none able to withstand God. And do you remember in the, the last message, I mentioned that there were two challenges that we were going to challenge ourselves with, and, and one of those was don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Never assume that, that God can't. Just because you can't make it work, just because you have tried your best and done everything you could, and yet you still come up against the wall, and you just still hit obstacle after obstacle and, and failure after failure, don't assume that God can't just because you can't. God is able. Just because you can't find a way, and just because you can't see how it could possibly happen, or you can't think of a, a, a path that would work, or, or a, you can't figure it out, just because you don't know, don't assume that God doesn't know. Don't assume that God cannot find a way. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. I want you to turn there and see this verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Paul starts this verse with a question. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Here's the first question he asks. What shall we say then to these things? And you know, he's talking about, um, he's talking about the inability that we have in our flesh to please God from the beginning of the chapter. He's talking about the sufferings and difficulties of this present time. And then he asks the question, okay, what are we going to say to those things? What's our response to those things? And what are we going to say when we face things in life? What's, what's our response going to be to all the things that we face? What you're going to face this week, the hardships of this week, the, the times where you just find that you can't do it, or you don't know what you're supposed to do, or you don't know how to make a way or how to find a way when all of that, right? When we face this week, what are we going to say to all of this week, to all that God wants us to do and all that God has for us this week, what are we going to say to that? To our inability and to our lack of wisdom. And Paul says this, if God be for us, who can be against us? Or you know what we're going to say? We're going to say God is able. We have a God that is unstoppable. And if God be for us, who can be against us? What can be against us if God is for us? If we have a God that is able... And there is so much that God is able to do for us and so much that God is able to do in us. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. There is so much that can be realized in us when we understand and trust in the fact that God is able to do all of this, to do so much for us, all that we need him to do. There is so much 
when we look at the fact that God is able. And in the weeks to come, we're going to see what God is able to do. But Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, go back to this verse. Being confident that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Be confident in that. Be confident that God is able. That the power of God means he's able to make a way. The wisdom of God means he's able to find a way. God is able. We have a God that truly is unstoppable. Let's close with prayer. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, it's so good for us to see who we are and see ourselves in comparison to you. Lord, may we not exalt ourselves, our power, or our wisdom, but may we always exalt you, your power and your wisdom, your ability. Lord, with all that we face this week, may we trust you. May we never trust ourselves. May we never try to do things in our strength or in our wisdom. But help us to always walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's all stand as we take our hymnals. Number 729. We're going to sing that chorus. God can do anything, anything, anything God can do, anything but fail. 729. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, he can keep, he can cleanse, and he will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Let's close with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that we've had in your house, for all that you've shown us, all that you've taught us, and we ask for your blessing as we go from here. Lord, with all the things that we will come up against this week, all that we have to do, we pray that we would do it in your strength and in your wisdom. We ask that you would keep us, keep us safe, Lord, physically but also spiritually. And we ask for your blessing now as we depart from here. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you.